Well, good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim Entwistle, the Director and Chief Executive of Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, and welcome, a very, very warm welcome to the Royal Botanic Gardens, and I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the land of the peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. I'd also like to welcome our delegates here, and I'll explain in a moment uh, why they're here from many countries around the world in the front rows here, and of course, our many guests here tonight. We have some uh, fantastic talks coming up, two really good speakers who I know you're going to love, and they're both, um, I, they've been responsible for what I think are the two uh, most inspiring plant conservation projects in the world. The, Millennium Seed Bank and Eden Project, both of which you'll hear much more about, and they've been involved in more than that, but they're just two amazing projects which you'll, you will hear about tonight. Now, overnight, some of you will have read that uh, or heard. Sir David Attenborough said that he was, in, he was at a major climate conference in Poland, a UN meeting, and he said, right now we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years, and David would know, so David, he has been around for a long time. Climate change is, if we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. So a very depressing uh, message from Sir David, and I know he's taken a long time to come to that uh, or strength of conviction to make those kind of pronouncements. He's been very careful not to over the years, but he now feels it's incredibly important he stands up and says that. So here we are today in a botanic garden. So what is it that we can do in a botanic garden or within a botanic garden organisation to, if you like, save civilization, to save our natural world? How can we provide the solutions that are needed? But also, how can we provide a positive message to uh, take us into the future? So for the health and survival of humans, for the health and survival of the planet, we need plants and we need plant diversity. That's kind of a fundamental message of botanic gardens and the variety of plants is something that's incredibly important to our planet. So it's a key message, if you like, but also, as I often say, it's the fact that plants make life worth living as well. So we need them to survive, but without them, life would be a, a, a far lesser thing than it is. So to spruik that message, we need the botanic gardens. We need those beautiful gardens outside here in Melbourne, beautiful gardens at Cranbourne, and the many beautiful gardens around the world, the many thousands of botanic gardens that exist. And they're places where science, culture, and nature coexist, where we combine those for these very strong messages such as uh, fighting climate change. So if we can't adapt those landscapes though, we can't make sure those botanical landscapes themselves survive through climate change, uh, then how can we make those bigger changes in attitude and behaviour? This is a key message and a key discussion point we're having this week at Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria with our international guests, is how do we look after those absolutely critical landscapes, those beautiful botanical landscapes that we need to tell people how important plants are. So we have with us uh, this week representatives from 10 botanic gardens plus other organisations from around the globe, from Argentina, Australia, China, Israel, South Africa, Spain, the UK and USA in alphabetical order. I was very careful with that. Uh, plus the heads of our two peak botanic garden bodies internationally and our Australia New Zealand network. So we're looking this week to create an alliance of botanic gardens particularly and, bot and like-minded organisations to not only look after those landscapes, to adapt those to climate change, but to make sure we as botanic gardens are effective in getting our message across. And we've had a stimulating today, a day today of discussions and tonight we're going to hear from two of our guests who've come for this uh, particular workshop and have offered very kindly to speak to us here on the big issues today. So we have two talks, the first one about botanic gardens and their essential role for, for humanity's survival in a climate change, uh, sorry, in a changing world. And then the Eden Project, Big Vision, Bigger Impact. Uh, they are both excellent speakers. I should point out at the start, some of you will, when you signed up, will have expected Tim Smith to be here. 
Uh, Tim unfortunately had to pull out uh, due to uh, for family reasons. But uh, having spent the day with our second speaker, David Harland, uh, I know we are going to be as equally entertained and equally informed as if Tim was here. In fact, I, David, Tim won't be able to hear us, will he? This won't be going anywhere internationally. You'll do much, much better than Tim would ever have done. Thank you. <laughs> so, our first speaker tonight, although let me say, first of all, I'm going to, we're going to have the two speakers talk. At the end of that, we will have a, a panel session. There'll be time for you to ask a few questions. I'll lead off with a couple and the three of us will be on stage. So I'll ask them to speak and then we'll have questions later. First up though, Dr Paul Smith, who is currently Secretary General of Botanic Gardens Conservation International, uh, the peak body and the largest, a uh, peak body for botanic gardens, but also the largest plant conservation network in the world, comprising 500 botanic gardens in 100 countries. And Paul has been Secretary General of that organisation since 2015. As I mentioned earlier, Paul was also, or previously, head of Royal Botanic Garden Kew's Millennium Seed Bank, an absolutely amazing project and responsible, I think, for its success and worldwide profile over the years he was head of that. Paul did train as a plant ecologist. He's a specialist in the plants and vegetation of southern Africa, uh, where he is, was born and lived. Yes, I, yes, did both, born and lived. And he's written field guides as well as numerous reports on conservation and seed banking and won awards for his contributions over 25 years to plant conservation. Please welcome Paul Smith. Thank you, Tim. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and also to participate uh, in the, the meeting we had today and then over the next few days um, discussing climate change. Now my task today is a little bit wider than just climate change. My job is to convince you that botanic gardens are essential uh, for humanity's survival. And notice my title does not have a question mark. Um, this is our hypothesis and, and I need to prove that to you, that we have an essential role to play. So if we look very, very quickly and try to condense 500 years or so of botanic garden science history. Uh, we can see that um, in the East and the West, botanic gardens were initially primarily set up as, as physic gardens to provide um, plants um, and material for, for medicines. Um, we then had, of course, during um, the days of imperial expansion uh, and empire, a shift from just medicines to economic botany, and, and this garden um, epitomizes that. Melbourne was a, a colonial garden set up to test commodities, plant commodities, to take them into industry to build economies. Um, the picture there of chinchona, but it could equally be tea, rubber, coffee, and so on. And driving that discovery, if you like, was the Enlightenment, of course, and um, going out and finding new opportunities. Uh, and with that, the science of taxonomy, the naming of plants, understanding how plants are related to each other and therefore how their traits uh, and properties uh, are related to each other. Um, and taxonomy, the science of systematics and taxonomy, grew into a discipline in its own right without necessarily there being um, dollars at, at the end of it. Um, and I would say that probably most, uh, certainly the, the, the majority of botanic garden science over the last century or so has been concentrated uh, on taxonomy, on naming, describing, collecting plants. Now, I, as I say, I have just, in a minute, um, put 500 years of history uh, in there, but I think that's, that more or less encapsulates where we are now. And over that period, we have, have built up um, these, these infrastructures, these, these botanic gardens. Um, there are around 3,000 botanic gardens in the world, and, and BGCI, my organization, keeps a register uh, of those botanic gardens you'll see that they're not necessarily evenly spread geographically. Um, but nevertheless, this is a, a tremendous technical network. We estimate there are 60,000, at least 60,000 scientists, horticulturists, and people within this network uh, who know better than anyone else about plant taxonomy right across the taxonomic array. 500 million people visit the world's botanic gardens each year, half a billion people. 
So a large proportion uh, of society where we can make an impact. And I should say at this point that David uh, will talk much more about the public engagement component. I'm going to concentrate uh, on the science um, and knowledge generation uh, in botanic gardens. Now, I thought I must take you on a quick tour of botanic gardens, if anything, just to, to persuade you to visit some of them. Of course, there are the gardens like Kew, which are well known around the world, the largest botanic garden in the world, 250 odd years old, um, right the way through to the more modern botanic gardens, Singapore Gardens by the Bay, 10 million visitors, very hard to argue with the wow factor. Some would say this is botanical bling. I love this garden. I think, you know, if you haven't visited, um, I, I recommend it. Uh, and then there are National gardens um, in places like Eastern Europe. This is Tbilisi in Georgia, built on an old landscape near the old city. Largely um, Caucasus um, uh, flora there, but um, a beautiful garden to visit, just emerging uh, into a new vision um, after the post-Soviet the post -Soviet era um, and, and growing particularly with plant conservation for the Caucasus. There are gardens with collections that are, are world-class. This is Huntington Botanic Garden in Pasadena in California that has the most incredible succulent uh, collection. It's where BGCI US uh, is based, and I was there a couple of weeks ago. There are temperate gardens um, that um, are more formal. This is Royal Botanic Gardens Ontario um, in Canada. This is their, their newest garden, which uh, opened just a, a couple of years ago. We have tropical gardens. This is South China Botanical Garden, subtropical if we're, if we're going to be picky. Um, but, um, you know, tremendous plant diversity there, as, as many of the Chinese gardens have. We have Australian gardens, and I, I do apologize. This is, this is Kings Park, uh, Western Australia, and I, I realize that you don't have to go there uh, and may not want to go there, um, but um, I, I, a great garden, nevertheless. Um, this one, I wonder if anyone can guess. Shiba, you're not allowed to answer this, this one. This is um, Johannesburg, and um, you might think that's a, a city garden, but it is built in this tremendous uh, landscape and this, this waterfall, the Walter Sisulu Botanic Garden, a, one of, like all of Sambi's gardens, concentrating on native South African plant diversity. So I thought it was worth putting the pictures in before I get to the heavy stuff, just to persuade you that we are a tremendously diverse um, network uh, in all sorts of landscapes in all kinds of places. But we also have unique scientific assets. Uh, we have um, our collections, which have been built up over hundreds of years, living collections, seed collections, and so on. We have skills. We can grow a wider range of plant diversity, and I'll show you a slide in a moment, than any other professional community. And we have information. We have uh, databases, floras, publications, and so on about plant diversity across the breadth uh, of the taxonomic array. But our big challenge is to point out uh, and work with the world to understand why this is relevant. Uh, and I think probably to everybody in this room, it's clear that plant-based solutions um, will be required for all of these ma major uh, environmental challenges and that plants sit right at the, right at the heart of, of these solutions. Food security, uh, I'll give you some examples in a moment, but we need new crops, we need to be eating a wider range of plant diversity. Water scarcity, think of catchment forests, or planting trees that need less water. Energy, biomass, biofuels, human health. Still, most of the world's medicines come from plants, um, and um, you've only got to think of China and India um, primary health care is still traditional medicine based on plants. Biodiversity conservation itself, if you want to conserve the tiger or the panda, you must conserve the plants at the base of the trophic pyramid. Uh, and then climate change, the focus of our discussions this week, both human adaptation and mitigation will require um, the use of plants. And in fact, we would go further. We would say absolutely that we have a world that, that needs uh, our help. Uh, and if you look at the Millennium Ecosystem Scenarios, which were published back in 2005, if we are going to be environmentally proactive, uh, then we're going to be doing a lot of gardening. We're going to be basically managing plant diversity and biodiversity generally 
um, in the landscape, whether that's techno gardening or adapting mosaics um, locally. And in case you think this is a future scenario, we are already there. We've transformed more than 50% of the ice-free terrestrial landscape already, uh, mainly for agriculture, pastoralism, but also for urbanization. And this paper estimates that um, more than 80% of the landscape has been influenced by, by human activities one way or the other. Climate change, of course, is the big elephant uh, in the room in that respect. But I think from our perspective, understanding that transformed landscapes are the norm and will only increase as population increases uh, is, is quite a, a fundamental step for us in understanding how we can intervene and how we as a professional community can help. Because we can grow plants that nobody else can grow, uh, and that surely uh, is going to be useful. So having made that statement, I, I actually have some figures here. BGCI also manages a database called Plant Search, which is a list of the plants which are grown in the world's botanic gardens. Now, I mentioned there are 3,000 gardens. We actually only have data from uh, now it's about 12, 1,200 botanic gardens. Um, so th these are minimal figures. But what we did was we compared what is grown in botanic gardens against the total list of plant species which is out there as far as we know. And the figures are actually quite um, astounding. Uh, we grow 93% of vascular plant families at the family. There are only 20 families of plant that are not in botanic gardens. And we've put those out as a challenge to our horticulturists to say, let's get those uh, as well. 30% of vascular plant species uh, are grown in botanic gardens. So, so uh, 115,000 different species are grown in the gardens that we have sampled. Uh, and then critically, 41% uh, on the global average of threatened species are held um, in botanic gardens uh, around the world as an insurance policy against their loss uh, in the wild. But what is the point uh, of holding all of this plant diversity? And I, I want to go back to those big environmental challenges and how we can help to solve those challenges. The first to look at uh, in a bit more detail is food security. We all need to eat, and with growing population, we're going to need to feed uh, more and more people. And when we look at our mainstream crops, our main staples, wheat, rice, maize, potatoes, every potato that, that we eat has genes in it that come from the wild progenitors um, of potato, the wild ancestors, the crop wild relatives. Uh, and in many cases, in the case of the potato, because of potato blight and uh, you know, many of the, the disease problems with potato, we've gone back to the wild progenitors and bred in the genes that we need for resistance to blight uh, and resistance to pests, um, also tolerance of climatic variables and so on. And when I was uh, a few years ago at um, the Millennium Seed Bank, we working with um, our partners, uh, the Crop Diversity Trust, who manage the Svalbard Seed Vault up in the Arctic Circle, which does crop species, the, um, the crop varieties and land races. The Millennium Seed Bank does wild species. We got together and we said, what about crop wild relatives? These, these progenitors, these wild relatives of crops that have these important traits like disease resistance, drought tolerance, and so on. And the first thing we did um, was to have a look, uh, do a gap analysis to see which of those crop wild relatives were already available to plant breeders. And the surprise for us was that more than half of them were not. There were 53% of these closely related crop wild relatives were not in seed banks and not available to plant breeders. They're out there in the wild taking their chances. Uh, and that analysis also showed us we had already lost a wild rice relative and we'd already lost a, a wild peanut relative. So getting out there urgently to collect, um, conserve, and make available uh, these crop wild relatives was this project. Um, this was um, established about seven years ago now. It's a 10-year program. And all of these countries, um, botanic gardens, have been working uh, with crop people to collect and conserve um, those missing crop wild relatives. But when you look at the role of botanic gardens in this whole process, it's not just actually about going out and collecting the seeds. We'd, we've done far more than that. The first thing you need to know is what are the close relatives to our crops? Uh, and the work that Botanic Gardens uh, have been doing uh, over 
hundreds of years in classifying um, phylogenies, if you like, trees, um, family trees of, of plants, tells us exactly which plant species we should be looking for that are most closely related to our domesticated crops and that will have the useful traits that can be bred back into those crops. So taxonomy is extremely important. We can also tell our colleagues which of them are most threatened uh, in the wild. Um, and many botanic gardens are involved in red listing or threat assessments. This is a, a recent study on Theaci on the tea family, um, looking at um, the relatives of tea. Uh, and a number of those are threatened with extinction. And they may well have useful traits, as I say, that can be used for future tea crops. And we have information about where these plants are, what they look like, uh, descriptions. This is actually um, a collection guide um, that was used by um, our seed collectors in this Adapting Agriculture project. Uh, and it tells them everything they need to know. It tells them where these plants, and this is a, a wild relative of aubergine or eggplant uh, in Mozambique, where the plant is, is found, what it looks like. Um, and also when it is likely to be in seed. So you're there at the right place at the right time and you can recognize the plant. And of course, plant recognition is not something, particularly for obscure um, species, is not something uh, that is found just, just out there um, everywhere. It takes a lifetime um, to, to really know your flora. So that expertise is also uh, in our institutions. And this is a picture of Aaron Davis from the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in South Sudan, um, collecting specimens of a, of a wild coffee relative. Um, again, with a view to resilience um, for coffee. Coffee, I think, is the world's second um, most valuable commodity. We all drink coffee. I know Tim does. And one of the things that we were particularly interested in was this $50 million that the Norwegian government had given to this. What, they asked, what is the return on investment for this? And we wanted to know in dollar terms. We looked at the scientific literature and there was very little information um, on um, the dollar value of the traits in crop wild relatives and how they're used today. So we, we commissioned uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to do the study for us and they did uh, interviews and reviews all around the world with, um, with crop breeders. And these were the figures that they came up with for the 29 focus crops for this project. $42 billion is the current value uh, of those, uh, those crops, those crop wild relatives and the traits used in breeding. And then economists love to, to, to discount values. They said future value, we estimated $120 uh, billion, not taking into account um, the effects of climate change. So that $50 million is looking like a pretty good investment. And of course, one of the, the challenges for us is that we are pinning our food security on very few species. I mentioned the 29, but, but actually 50% you know, of our calorie intake comes from just three plant species, from maize, wheat, and, and rice. Um, that is a very narrow genetic base for people in perpetuity. And we know that there are many thousands of edible plant species out there, uh, many of them, though, not domesticated. Uh, and this was one of those. This is um, Shinsia phyton, uh, Rauta neni, or the Manketi tree from southern Africa, my, my part of the world, um, the Kalahari. It uh, grows up to a 10-meter tree, um, dry conditions, uh, and it produces these nuts in profusion. They're a bit like a macadamia nut, but very high uh, in protein and fat. Um, but we couldn't germinate it. Um, and fortunately, there were groups here in, um, in Australia but also in South Africa, at the South African National Biodiversity Institute, who'd worked out that smoke was an important trigger for many species um, in savanna ecosystems. They come up after a fire. And at the Millennium Seed Bank, we tried to germinate this species for many years. But speaking to our collaborators, they said, well, try smoke. Uh, and we popped it into the smoke solution. You know this with your flora now. But at that time, that was not common knowledge. And up, up it came 100% germination within a week. So suddenly, we are in a position to cultivate this, this species. Uh, and trials are underway um, in Botswana um, to see whether this could be cultivated at scale. I have to say, I spoke to a Botswana lady about this and said, you know, is it a, a, a wonderful thing? And she said, yes, it tastes really good, but it makes my husband smell like an animal. 
So we're thinking, well, that could be a good thing, but maybe, maybe not. Uh, we shouldn't add that in the marketing. So some of these do, do need sort of um, further work, I think, to, to fine tune. Afforestation and, and restoration, and I'm sorry I've used Kings Park again. Um, here I am in southeastern Australia, but um, certainly Australia, I would say, are very much at the forefront of ecological restoration and ecological restoration at scale, largely because of interaction with the mining industry. Uh, and this uh, example from Kings Park, sitting above Perth, the Jarra Forest, working um, with Alcoa for decades now to put back a, a temperate forest which is approximately what was there before the bauxite was taken out. Um, and that kind of knowledge and sharing that knowledge around the global network is, is really uh, important as we start to understand how to put back complex ecosystems. Uh, and BGCI actually manages the Ecological Restoration Alliance of Botanic Gardens with around 40 participating gardens, um, managing projects all, all over the world, trying to learn how we can do this. Um, the picture on, on the left there is Erica Vaticillata from Cape Town, reintroduced after 100 years of being extinct in the wild as part of Sand Plain Fambos. And the only reason that it was extinct was because of municipal Cape Town. Cape Town was built on top of its habitat. And now it's been reintroduced, it's doing, doing very well uh, indeed. And then on the right, the picture is from Kadori um, Botanic Garden in Hong Kong, and this is a, a grand experiment that was set up about seven years ago now, 50 hectares, um, 400,000 plants, to try to put back a complex subtropical forest. So the aim is an already uh, establishment of 300 different species within a 50 hectare uh, area. We want to replicate this methodology, which is extremely thorough, testing every variable um, on every continent so that we can try to learn um, the lessons we need to learn about growing back tropical forests. Uh, and then a little bit closer to where I am now um, in the UK and, uh, and around, if you like, formal forestry. Um, one of the issues that we, we have, and I'll show you a slide in, in a moment, um, has been, and I know you have the same here with dieback and so on, is new pests and diseases coming in. Um, and one of the, the really useful things that you can build there uh, is uh, a genetically comprehensive national tree seed collection that you can use for testing, um, for screening for pest and disease resistance, for biological controls, um, et cetera. So um, certainly the Millennium Seed Bank now has been working for the last five years to build that collection. And the thing that actually triggered this was um, uh, Calara um, fraxinus. I think it has a different term. Um, generic name now, but this new fun this fungus that came in and affected our ash trees um, in the British landscape. People love their ash trees. The Prince of Wales got excited, and so the government said, well, we've got to do something, and um, we found the money, basically, to build um, this national tree seed collection, collecting seeds from across every seed zone in the United Kingdom, and those are now being used to test for natural resistance to this particular fungus. And some natural resistance has been found, the idea then is you plant the cohorts um, of resistant trees um, instead of um, susceptible trees. So BGCI also manages another network. This is the International Plant Sentinel Network, which is meant to spot these pests and diseases before they arrive on our shores. And we have um, botanic gardens all around the world are part of this, um, keeping an eye to see what comes. Um, this is a picture on the right there of um, emerald ash borer, which has caused absolute devastation um, in the United States, wiping out millions of hectares uh, of ash trees there. It's coming to Western Europe. It's in Russia at the moment, but through the Sentinel Network, um, we have people watching out for it, and if we can nip it in the bud, uh, then that's a much better way of trying to control it after it comes. Uh, invasive species, again, botanic gardens have a great history, um, I'm, I'm afraid, in introducing invasive species, but over recent years in understanding how we can spot them be before they become uh, invasive. And certainly Australia's um, weed risk assessment procedure is now used uh, all, all around the world uh, as, as a model. And really important that botanic gardens show leadership in this, this area. Uh, and one specific example, again, from the Millennium Seed Bank, the value of having native um, collections. Um, 
we have a major problem there with Japanese knotweed, uh, and um, the government spends, uh, well, millions of, uh, of pounds each year trying to control this, this pest. Um, but CABI, working on this, wanted to re release a biological control, but to get the license to do that, they needed to know that it had no detrimental effect on the native flora. So we were able to supply them with all of the native species they needed to test, save them the bother of going out, trying to identify these things, collect them in seed and so on, and save them um, at least a year on releasing this biological control. Uh, and that intervention um, was estimated by the London School of Economics, to, depending on the, 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 the efficacy of this control, to be worth between 27 um, and 121 million pounds. So climate change, five minutes, thank you. I'm gonna to need to whiz through then. Um, phenology is something many botanic gardens are working on, understanding um, really how plants um, and insects and others are responding to um, the changing in changes in climate. Um, the work understanding how we can adapt, which is, is led here, I think there's a groundbreaking study here and what has brought us here this week uh, in what we plant for the future um, and understanding tolerances of, of plants in our botanic gardens, but also in the wider landscape. Um, and, you know, one thing I want to emphasize is that we don't need to be doing all of the research ourselves. This is just taken from the annual report of the Cambridge University Botanic Garden, looking at all of the research that they support just by providing collections from their seed bank and from their living collections. In there is just about everything to do with environmental challenges. Uh, and just um, a couple of examples that came across my desk uh, earlier this year, and I'm just going to pick out the middle because it was from here. We found this seed in the Victoria Seed Bank here. This came out of the blue. It was from a pediatrician in the Netherlands who said that he's working on this um, children's disease, um, a liver disease, um, biliary atresia. And they'd noticed that you get exactly the same symptoms in animal poisoning from this plant. And they wanted to understand what the mechanisms were. And they needed this plant, which um, occurs here in Australia. And it was right in this seed bank. It was the only place in the world that we could find this material, which has now been sent um, to these medical researchers in the Netherlands. Um, and I think visitor engagement. You know, we, again, it's not just our scientists that, that get on with this. And this is an example from Garden in the Woods in Massachusetts, empowering um, people to go out and, and get involved in plant conservation. Um, giving them tools to do so, um, the citizen science element. Uh, and this one I particularly like around um, changing behaviours. Um, this is Phipps Conservatory uh, in Philadelphia. Free garden membership if you switch to renewable energy, which you can do on the site. Uh, and they had a huge uptake on this just in the first few, few months. And as you go into Phipps, you see the 36 barrels of oil that an average family in the US uses every year. So you can calculate what the savings are with this. So, conclusions, Tim. Plants are fundamental to solving the most important challenges facing humanity um, and human innovation, adaptation, and resilience. We in botanic gardens are, are uniquely placed um, to conserve, manage, and use plant diversities. We can do all of these things. We can find them, identify them, conserve them, grow them, and carry out and support vital research. Um, but we can also bridge this gap between research and practice. We have people who can research plants and also people who can grow plants. Um, and too often we don't join that, those up. So one of my key conclusions really is working together. Uh, and that means no silos in botanic gardens. It means horticulturists working with scientists and educators and everybody else um, and bringing all of our skills uh, to bear in a multidisciplinary way. We also need to go out and find others. We mustn't be too picky. I think this is a little picky. She's obviously, uh, maybe he, is looking for someone that I think is, is a mythical creature. But we need to go out. We need to find partners um, to work with us uh, and where we can make an impact. But I would say our, our biggest challenge, and we've heard this week from our facilitators, that, um, that um, strategy uh, is blown out of the water by culture. Um, Culture is so important, and one of the challenges for us in the botanic garden community is to change our own culture. Um, and 
I received this book. Many of you will have seen this rather ironic take on the Ladybird books. This is the husband book. Um, I didn't receive My wife received two copies for Christmas a couple of years ago. How the husband works, and it has useful information in it, like uh, this is a husband. He may look complicated. I think all the... There's a lot of wives nodding here, but no, no men. Um, but the other, one of the other books in the series is, is The Shed. And I think Roland uh, in this shed, who's spending Easter sorting his screws <laughs> while his wife and children visit his mother, um, it needed doing, says Roland. I think he's very like us in Botanic Gardens. We've spent um, centuries collecting, classifying, putting them into the different pots and so on. But surely this is a means to the end. It is not the end in itself. We need to know what these plants are, what they're called, what they look like, identify them so that we can manage to use them and, and conserve them. And that is the big challenge for us and our community as we move out of the taxonomic age um, into managing, conserving, and using plant diversity. And I put this challenge up to Botanic Gardens. This is uh, just launched this week through a new journal, Plants, People, and Planet. If you can't demonstrate how your research helps us to better conserve, use, or manage plant diversity, then why are you doing it? Now, there will be many academics who don't agree with this, but I think that challenge needs to go out there because we need to find societal relevance um, and quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. That's, that's excellent. I was a bit worried at the end there. Our Australian government at the moment is looking for relevance in research, and, but that kind of relevance I like. 